Welcome to Human Biology course, uh, first lecture that I'm going to be recording for our chapter 14 in the Human Biology by Michael Jox Johnson textbook. Um, now, we have already gone through multiple chapters in this book, as you're familiar. Uh, this time we're going to be dealing with the digestive system, which is another way of calling gastrointestinal system. Uh, all the notes for these videos will be available on Blackboard online. Uh, so if you can't see something in the video, the text, the, uh, the way it's spelled, you will have these notes. You'll see them in exactly the same format, so you'll be able to copy them properly. Um, now, let's get started. Essentially, for the digestive system, we are talking about a set of organs in the body primarily in the abdominal uh, cavity, below the thoracic cavity, below the chest, uh, but also some organs in the oral cavity, right, going through the neck, through this area. In order to break down the food to allow nutrients to be absorbed into the bloodstream, into our cells. So nutrients like sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and others, vitamins, minerals as well, all the typical nutrients we are familiar with, they need to be somehow passing through the gastrointestinal tract and absorbed properly. So first for the actual functions. In the oral cavity, right, meaning inside the mouth, we begin with the mechanical processing. Uh, this means essentially using the muscles, using the jaw and the teeth to physically chew and break down the food. Um, so that's what mechanical processing means, is basically chewing the food, using the saliva, mixing it in, in there to make the food moist, to make it easily uh, absorbed later on to be broken down so that we can actually swallow it and let it go through the rest of the digestive tract. Uh, when we think of secretion, we're thinking essentially about secretion of anything like saliva or enzymes or other molecules to help you break down the food. Uh, so for saliva, like I said, an example is basically the food will be mixed in uh, with saliva in order to make it easier to break it down later on for it to be swallowed and absorbed eventually. For chemical digestion, again, in a similar fashion, it could be thinking about enzymes mixing into the food to help you break down the nutrients into smaller molecules, uh, something even... Uh, early on inside the oral cavity or especially in the small intestine, stomach, large intestine, those areas where most of the chemical digestion will be taking place. Again, using enzymes, using those uh, molecules that break down a larger piece of material, piece of food into smaller and smaller molecules until they can be absorbed by the bloodstream. And ultimately, we need to do the absorption, which is the process of actually getting in the small molecules into our bloodstream, right? So they can go to all the cells in the body. So again, I'm talking about small molecules like uh, sugars, like glucose and others, amino acids from the proteins, fats and others, right? All of them eventually need to be absorbed so the cells can survive and get their nutrients. And finally, there's elimination, which is the process of getting rid of the waste material later on at the end of the digestive tract uh, usually basically in the large intestine and uh, once that waste is ready to be removed right it can be expelled from the body uh, and then uh, eliminated okay so now let's talk about the structures involved here so like I said before we would like to essentially go from the very beginning um, be able to trace the entire gastrointestinal tract from the entry point of food when you ingest it to the elimination process right there's a direct connecting line from the mouth all the way down to the anal canal where the food will be, or the waste rather right, will be expelled. So we start the oral cavity again. This is just basically another word for the mouth where you put in the food, uh, you chew it, you mix it in the saliva, you make sure that it starts that process of being broken down. The better you chew the food, the make it easier for yourself, for the stomach to get it absorbed finally and be broken down easily. And so uh, this is very, very important process. 
Again, remember, chewing is another word for mechanical processing, so again, taking place in the oral cavity. And once you have swallowed the food, right, it continues to go further down. First, it reaches the pharynx, which is basically the back of the throat area. That area is also shared, not just with the digestive tract, but also with the respiratory system, as oxygen and air is going through there as well. Uh, no absorption is taking place there, right? There's just a transit point for the food to continue. Then it enters the esophagus. Esophagus is essentially just a long, muscular, tube uh, that basically allows for the food to be moved from your pharynx down into the stomach. Uh, esophagus has two types of muscles. The upper one third of the esophagus is skeletal muscles for voluntary control and the rest of the esophagus is all smooth muscle, involuntary control, right? So like as you're swallowing, you're obviously aware of it consciously, but then later on, as the smooth muscle takes over, uh, the food begins to go down by itself through automatic contractions of the smooth muscle and reaches then further then into this stomach. Uh, and that transition point from the esophagus to the stomach, there is a sphincter. So a sphincter is basically, I'm gonna write it over here, uh, is essentially a muscle, that circular muscle that opens and closes under involuntary contractions to allow, in this case, the food to progress from the esophagus into the stomach. Um, and once it opens up, the food reaches into the stomach. The stomach is a J-shaped organ uh, full of muscle, surrounded by lots of blood vessels with a very significant nerve supply and blood supply. And inside the stomach, we have the stomach acid, which is the hydrochloric acid, HCl. Uh, there, it also mixes in with the enzymes and with the food to try to break it down. Um, there is a layer of mucus inside the stomach to prevent the stomach from being destroyed by the acid. That is very important to keep in mind. Uh, but overall, essentially, the stomach is there uh, to absorb the food to some extent, but mostly to continue processing the food to start to break it down more and more, and then eventually pass the food along down into the small intestine where most of the actual chemical digestion and absorption of the food will take place. So once you are past the stomach, you enter the small intestine. The small intestine uh, is over 20 feet long in a human and contains three portions, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Uh, duodenum is the shortest part, uh, the just a few inches long, and then jejunum and ileum are much longer. Uh, the important portion of the duodenum um, something to keep in mind that's very different is that not only is the food is getting absorbed and broken down, but it's actually also connected ultimately through an opening to the gallbladder, basically ultimately to the liver and to the pancreas, which will be sending uh, things like bile and enzymes into the small intestine to help you break it down. Um, now, Again, for the small intestine, we have three portions, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. Duodenum is the essential first portion where the enzymes are gonna be coming in and other material like bile to start breaking down the food. And then as it continues further through jejunum and ileum, we will see essentially, like you'll see in pictures in histology and in the book, there is very significant increases in surface area. There's all these folds and what's called villi and microvilli uh, that are microscopic to make sure that surface area is dramatically increased to speed up absorption of molecules right and let your body absorb them into the bloodstream to make sure that you get the nutrients to your cells once all of this has happened basically and again most of the molecules like sugars proteins and fats will be absorbed and broken down in the small intestine uh, the food can continue going into the large intestine, which is the last major portion of the gastrointestinal tract. There, uh, we are essentially separating this, uh, so into these sections. Now, the large intestine is only around five feet long, but has more named components. Now, keep in mind that these components are named, but in reality, when you actually see it, uh, they don't necessarily do different things or look very different. This is just done more like for purposes of surgical anatomy and certain convenience. So when you see it in the book, right, 
uh, look at the pictures, make sure you're finding these structures, but keep in mind, uh, they are named differently, but does not mean that very different things are happening there. Mostly the job of the large intestines to finishing up absorption, mostly of water, of compacting and dehydrating the food and getting prepared to become waste, which will be expelled by the body. Um, now, so the first portion of the large intestine is the cecum. Uh, cecum is basically just a pouch uh, in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. Uh, the way we know this is the cecum is we always see the appendix, kind of this little small worm-like structure hanging off the cecum. The appendix doesn't do anything for us other than cause sometimes problems when it gets impacted or kind of blocked with bacteria and infection, like waste, right? If there's a case of, let's say, appendicitis. But essentially, the main structure is actually the cecum. And uh, after the cecum, right, we have the ascending colon as the sort of the larger test that continues upwards towards the liver. At the point of the liver, it makes a turn to the other side of the body. That's what we call the transverse colon, right? This kind of migrates to the left side. Then we encounter the spleen, make another turn going down as the descending colon. And then finally, sigmoid colon, which makes like an S turn, uh, like a kind of twisting motion in the bottom, the left side, and then going into the rectum and the anal canal. In the anal canal, there's multiple sphincters, right? So there's involuntary, involuntary sphincters, again, these rounded muscles that circular uh, structures that allow the waste to be expelled uh, during defecation, elimination, right, of waste. Um, and so by this point, once you're sort of towards the very end in the sigma colon and rectum, right, this is all just essentially waste uh, and <clears throat> no actual nutrients will be really absorbed at that point, right? You should have been doing that earlier on in the small intestine and uh, in, in, in those early portions. And here, the waste is getting ready, right? It's staying there for some time, accumulating, and then uh, once ready, it could be removed upon defecation, right, and uh, elimination from the body. So again, make sure you're able to trace the whole structures from the beginning to the end, from the oral cavity to the anal canal. Now, for the accessory structures that we have, just to keep them in mind, uh, these are not major organs, but still very, very important structures in the digestive tract that are solid organs, so food isn't passing actually through them. Uh, so organs like the liver, the pancreas, uh, and the salivary glands. We go through each of them one by one just to kind of explain what they're doing, make sure in the book to see them, obviously, what they look like, what their appearance is. Uh, we can talk about, let's talk about the salivary glands very quickly. Essentially what they are, right? These are the glands that secrete saliva into the oral cavity, right? So something like the parotid gland, which is on the side of the head, submandibular gland under the jaw, uh, and some other smaller ones. They all are doing the same thing, secreting saliva, making sure it's mixing with the food to make it moist, and also secreting some enzymes there to break down carbohydrates. Uh, when we talk about the liver, the liver is a very large organ. Uh, there's a lot of functions for the liver. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna outline here only just a few of them. You'll see more in the book. Uh, it's up to you how much you want to kind of go deeper into this. But essentially the liver, again, is a solid organ, organ containing hepatocytes. These are small, uh, these are cells that are essentially, have enzymes in them that will take nutrients coming from the digestive tract to break them down there and then send them along into the rest of the body. Uh, so what hepatocytes are doing is basically, again, processing essentially all the nutrients coming from the digestive tract. They're doing this through the hepatic portal system, which is the venous system, veins, draining blood from the small intestine, the stomach, and the rest of the digestive tract, taking them to the liver to get processed by the hepatocytes, by the enzymes there. Uh, the liver also produces bile, uh, which has bile acids, which are there to break down fats Right, fatty acids, lipids, these molecules are very long, insoluble in blood and need to be broken down and kind of treated in a separate ladder, a little bit more complicated. So liver secretes bile, 
allows it to go to the gallbladder for storage and then the bile being connected to the duodenum. There's an opening there for the common bile duct, this connection from the gallbladder to the duodenum. When you're eating fatty meal, right, those fats need to be broken down, obviously, right, so the bile will mix in from the gallbladder there uh, in the duodenum and get eventually in the, in the state where it could be more easily absorbed. Okay, so when you're thinking of the liver, just to summarize, the liver is there, like I said, to use the enzymes, to produce bile, to detoxify things, uh, to produce proteins, produce hormones, the things like albumin, which is an important uh, blood protein, one of the most important proteins in the body, is produced by the liver, along with many other hormones and proteins as well. And all of these many functions make the liver so important for survival, that is one of the most important organs we have, absolutely essential for normal uh, functioning of the whole body, not just the digestive tract, but overall uh, homeostasis of the body. Um, now, when we get to the pancreas, <clears throat> for the pancreas, again, this is an organ sitting behind the stomach, also connected to the duodenum ultimately, uh, because there are these uh, major pancreatic ducts connecting them there. And the best way to think about the pancreas is to kind of split it into the parts to say, well, there's exocrine pancreas and endocrine pancreas. The exocrine, exo, referring to the enzymatic secretions that will go into the ducts and mix in with the food to break it down, to break down sugars, proteins, other molecules as you're eating them, so as they are appearing in the duodenum. Okay, so exocrine means digestive enzymes are going into the small intestine. And the endocrine portion is there for hormones, right? So there are multiple different hormones uh, produced by the pancreas, including insulin, glucagon, and some others. So uh, we will come back to these when we talk about the endocrine system. But one insulin, for instance, is essential for uh, glucose control in the body. So for instance, people who have diabetes, they have problems with insulin. Either they're resistant to insulin or can't produce them at all. <coughs> and so overall, uh, this is how we're separating this. Exocrine pancreas, digestive enzymes are secreted through the ducts. Endocrine hormones directly being secreted into the bloodstream, hormones like insulin, glucagon and others, and also very important for digestion to control uh, all aspects of digestion, especially control of carbohydrate processing uh, and other molecules. Hepatic portal system, again, already explained, essentially talking about how the blood is being drained through the venous system from the digestive system. As the molecules being absorbed, they go to the liver first, for processing by the hepatocytes and then continue on their way after that to the rest of the body and salivary glands, right? They're just producing saliva in the oral cavity to help us break down, moisten the food and start breaking down uh, things like starch, sugars. Now, uh, for the nutrients and nutrition here, um, Again, just a brief overview of these concepts, you'll see much more in the book. So first, where are these molecules actually being absorbed, right? So there's three main types of molecules we talk about here. Carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, right? So sugars, proteins, and fats. Uh, and so for the sugars, where are they being absorbed? They're being absorbed, or rather, broken down, rather, more correctly, broken down in the oral cavity, and then finally, broken down continuously in small intestine and then finally absorbed in the small intestine. And then for the proteins, we're talking about uh, the stomach, uh, the enzymes there and the help of the hydrochloric acid and uh, the rest of the proteins, because they're so large, are being broken down and absorbed in the small intestine. Uh, for the lipids, for the fats, we're talking about small intestine Primarily, so like I said, thinking of bile acids, thinking of other enzymes from the pancreas to mixing with the fats, make them more soluble so they actually can be absorbed. 
For the vitamins and minerals and fiber, um, again, there's quite a lot of potential things to learn here. Uh, you'll see that in the book. I asked you to remember just a few of these that I'm gonna outline here. Uh, again, you're welcome to um, look at more sources to find more information about them. Uh, we all are familiar with vitamins and minerals, right? So they are one of these micronutrients that we need uh, for our body to function normally. Usually we think of vitamins as essential for enzymes to function. They act as what's called cofactors for enzymes and minerals uh, often are present as part of major molecules like hemoglobin and others and things like hormones that also need them to function properly. Uh, at this point, the best way to say this is essentially separated vitamins into fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. Uh, the fat soluble are only four vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. These are, could be stored in the body. Uh, and let's quickly just kind of go over them, uh, why we need each one. Again, there's a lot of information, like I keep saying, in the book and other sources about them. And you probably are familiar with some of this. What I actually want you to know about this is only the things I'm gonna say here. Um, and so it's uh, kind of focusing on just unique kind of features, essential components for these. So for the fat soluble vitamins, again, vitamin A, again, essential for vision, eyesight, right? Uh, basically, these are what's called like carotenes. And so like you find them in foods that are kind of orange in color, like carrots, let's say, and pumpkin and things like that. Vitamin D is essential for processing calcium. Um, and like we find it in milk, dairy products. Vitamin E is an antioxidant important in the immune system function. Vitamin K is important for blood clotting. Um, and so, Vitamin K is often found in like leafy green vegetables. Uh, vitamin E could be found in uh, many different sources, uh, including something like butter and uh, all kinds of different foods. Again, more specific about this, you'll find information in the textbook. Uh, again, for these four vitamins, A is for vision, D for calcium absorption, E is an antioxidant, K for blood clotting. Uh, for the water soluble vitamins, the most important one is vitamin C, very, very essential. This is the vitamin that you need to obtain essentially constantly, found in citrus fruits, lemons, limes, uh, lots of other fruits uh, and vegetables even. And very important for collagen, to build collagen, right? This is one of the most important protein in connective tissue, like in skin and bones and cartilage, we need collagen, right? So vitamin C must be present because that's what we need to build it. Uh, and so very important vitamin. And then we have lots of B vitamins, B1, B6, B12, and on. Um, again, they have different names. A lot of them are important for nervous system function, for functioning of DNA, other cell functions, right? Uh, now, and we get them from different foods and sort of, again, remember all of these we need in extremely small quantities. Uh, so as long as you have a normal balanced diet, which is very, very important, uh, you will, should be able to get enough vitamins and minerals in your diet, uh, along with these other components that we already talked about, like sugars and proteins and all of those. Okay, the balance in the diet is so important. Uh, the, the next component is minerals. Uh, there are many minerals, we talked about some of them already. I talked about like elements essentially. So iron is very important, right? We need this for hemoglobin, that's the molecule that carries oxygen in the red blood cells. Uh, we have calcium that we need that's important for bones, right? To give the strength or rigidity to bones, right? Calcium is also essential for nerve system function, for muscles to function, right? Very, very common element, right? They often see it as calcium electrolyte, but also could be in other forms that we find it. So we need to get that from our diet, definitely, okay? And then another important mineral, something we didn't talk about, but iodine, this is, essentially you get from seafood usually, uh, from salt, if it's iodized salt, and iodine is there for the endocrine system, specifically for the function of the thyroid, and when we get to the endocrine system, I'm gonna go over this more, but essentially the thyroid hormones need iodine to function properly, right, to make those hormones in the gland.
Okay, I'm going to explain what that means in the endocrine direction. For the fiber, uh, fiber is the undigestible plant material, basically the cell wall of plants. So when you're eating enough fruits and vegetables, right, those materials that are undigestible will pass through quickly through your digestive tract and allow the waste to be removed successfully, right, to prevent constipation, prevent problems like that. So fiber, absolutely essential. Again, the only way to get fiber properly is through uh, eating fruits, vegetables, things like cereals. Uh, and again, even though it's undigestible material, right, so we're not actually absorbing those molecules into our cells, uh, because they're allowing for faster transit, right, they kind of carry the waste with them, removing them from the body. <clears throat> and for the last component, basically uh, talking about some of our disorders as we always do right towards the end. So we have obesity, malnutrition, and hepatitis. Uh, obesity, essentially we have to talk about BMI. Uh, BMI is the body mass index. So the way we think of BMI is essentially um, a ratio of weight to height of the person, right? So how many kilograms they are per meter squared of height, right? That's what BMI is. And essentially the way to talk about is that BMI from around uh, 20 something to 24.9, let's say, is normal. Uh, then from 25 to 30, the person I'm gonna say is overweight and over 30, they are obese. Okay, so again, normal weights are around 20 to 24 and a half, uh, 24.9, 25 to 30 is person's overweight, right, which is getting into that abnormal state essentially, and obesity happens at about over 30, and then BMI can continue to increase, right? So again, that comparison of weight and height is very, very important because someone could be 100 pounds and five feet tall and be normal weight, and someone could be 100 pounds and six feet tall and be obviously significantly underweight. And so <clears throat> we never just consider only weight, we consider height as well. Uh, obesity, right, is a big epidemic in the United States of so many people are now overweight and obese, which very important because it increases chances of diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, liver disease, and many, many other disorders all connected to increased fat storage, right, often due to sedentary lifestyles, people not exercising, not eating the right kind of foods, not having proper diets, and all of this eventually, as a chronic disease accumulates, to give problems like, like I said, like diabetes, uh, heart disease, and many others. And so again, it's not something that happens overnight, right? This is a kind of long-term, life-term, essentially, disorder. Uh, and is a type of malnutrition, essentially, right? So when somebody says malnutrition, it doesn't mean it's like malnourishment, uh, as in someone who's anorexic or doesn't have enough weight, but actually someone who's obese is also considered having malnutrition, basically improper nutrition, and right, those need to be addressed with the doctor to treat that person, to make sure that they get back to normal weight, uh, so that they reduce their risk of all of these disorders, these problems. So again, obesity, very common in the United States, unfortunately, is increasing around the world as well. Uh, there is multiple different ways to treat obesity. Sometimes there are interventions in terms of medication, sometimes just guidance offered to the patient, like counseling the patient. Sometimes there are like surgeries where um, liposuction could be done, extra fat reserves could be removed, or actually decreasing the size of the stomach, stapling the stomach, removing the stomach even in extreme situations all kinds of others, uh, but some treatment definitely needs to be done, right? It doesn't have to be extreme immediately, right? We don't go to the surgeon right away, but we do need to address this. Okay, read up in the book more about this and see what the author is saying.
uh, <clears throat> and for hepatitis, essentially, right, there's multiple types of hepatitis. This is inflammation of the liver, right? Specifically, I want to talk about viral hepatitis. Uh, so the way we separate this is that there is uh, hepatitis A and hepatitis E, and then hepatitis B and C, and there's some others. Uh, the way we separate this, again, they're all viruses that infect the liver, causing liver damage. Vitamin A and E are due to oral fecal contamination. So meaning like when you go to a restaurant, let's say for example, and someone who was preparing your food was not washing their hands, they potentially, if they have that virus, they can transmit this to you. Right? The good thing about this is this is usually kind of self-contained limited uh, disorder that might result in like vomiting, diarrhea, but eventually often doesn't even need treatment and will go away by itself. While hepatitis B and C, usually much more severe, they're blood-borne disorders, uh, sometimes transmitted through sexual contact or through needle sharing or IV drug use. And for these hepatitis, right, they can actually result in severe liver damage, uh, can result in jaundice, which is yellowing of the skin, and eventually even liver cancer long term okay they're much more difficult to treat now we thankfully have some more available therapies right so hepatitis b and c more severe disorders liver results in more liver damage um, make sure to read chapter 14 for this discussion and uh, i will provide the notes online for you to to study